about, uh, I'm going to start with the project that I've been working on at the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, a collaborative project with Barbara Stoffaker Solomon, a landscape designer and a graphic designer from the West Coast. And I'm going to also talk about a couple of projects that are a couple of, of years old and try to trace for you how certain ideas are started in a project and how you find yourself going back to those ideas. I'm sure you've found this in your own studio projects. Instructors will say to you, you know, that looks a lot like what you did in second year in my class. And they're not necessarily accusing you of being lazy, or that may, in fact, be what they're accusing you of. I don't know. But it's very possible that what they're pointing out to you is that sets of concerns continue to come back to you in your work. I think that's an important thing about landscape architecture, because th sometimes it takes an entire professional career to work out an idea. It's not, I mean, people, it's very hip right now to talk about landscape architecture as an art. And, you know, artists are doing landscapes. And, you know, God knows architects are doing landscapes. And even landscape architects occasionally make landscapes. But thinking of the landscape as an, as an art is, it makes it all too easy, really. Um, landscape architecture is, you, you have to be into it for the long haul. Projects have to grow. It takes a very long time for them to be realized physically. But the biggest problem is that if you have any real ideas that you're trying to sort out professionally that may relate to your own life in any particular way, it can take a very long time, years, for the opportunity to even try an idea again in a slightly different way. I suppose um, when I was younger, um, even younger than I am, that was something that used to bother me. But as I see people in other fields um, approaching their middle age, um, landscape architecture is really a great field to grow older in because you have this, I, these ideas that you've been sort of pulling along with you, maybe ever since your first studio as an undergraduate. And it's really wonderful that way. The landscape really doesn't change that much. I drove back and forth across Route 70 many times uh, when I was traveling back and forth between Boston and Urbana. And the landscape, it changes a lot, but it doesn't really change that much. And that's one of the damnable things about landscape architecture, but it's one of the really terrific things about it. Anyway, on with the slides. Um, is this going to stay on? Oh. I'll start with the anecdote. Uh, this is the Walker Art Center Sculpture Garden in Minneapolis, um, a fascinating project that I had only a little bit to do with. The Barbara Solomon and I designed the landscape that's in this conservatory, which was designed by the office of, of Edward Larrabee Barnes from New York City. Three years ago this September, um, I got a call from the design director of the Walker. Her name is Mildred Friedman. And she said, um, hello, this is Mildred Friedman. I'm calling to tell you that we're going to ask you to be one of the designers of the conservatory gardens at the Walker Art Center. We'd like you to work with Barbara Solomon from San Francisco, which was fine. I have a lot of respect for her, for her writings and her work. And I said, oh, fine, that's terrific. You know, I was jumping up and down. And um, she said, there really aren't any constraints. Um, there are no budget constraints. We don't have endless money to spend, but you're going to have to define what the budget is. And then there will be a period of time set aside. We'll try to raise the money. And if we can find it, then we'll build the gardens. She said, there is really only one constraint. And I said, oh, what's that? She said, well, there has to be a piece of sculpture by an architect in the conservatory. And uh, never knowing to keep my big mouth shut, I said, well, that'll be fine as long as it's not by Frank Gehry. Um, well, she said, well, the piece is by Mr. Gehry. 
and you'll probably come to like it. I said, oh, I'm sure I will, and you know, <laughs> got off the phone very quickly, um, happy that she hadn't terminated the commission on the spot. But it turns out it is a, a neat piece, uh, and I'll show it to you in a minute. Uh, a little bit about the, pr the setting, because it's, very, it's a very forward-thinking project, and you've probably seen maybe too many articles about it. I think landscape architecture is even finally going to have one in April or May or something like that. The office of Cornell Rothschild in New York City and Ed Barnes, the same person who designed the building, designed the sculpture garden, which is out here. And it's the idea of a four square with two axial paths running through it. And the central path, the I'm on the roof of the walker where I took this photograph. The central path terminates on a, on a piece by Klaus Oldenburg called Spoon and Cherry, which was commissioned for the garden. The pond is just being filled with water in this picture that we're looking at here. Our responsibility were for a series of, of enclosures that provide a very important uh, part of the scheme, a very minor but very important part, which is that the parking lots for accessing the walker are actually about 600 yards from the entry to the museum. And the idea of the long greenhouses along the side of the sculpture garden is to provide a covered passageway uh, in the winter and in inclement weather during rain and so forth, which is uh, in summer, which is you know two or three months in Minnesota. The rest of the year, it's um, pretty harsh. Actually, it's not really quite that bad. Anyway, uh, much of the year, um, Minneapolis is under snow, and the idea was to establish this processional through the greenhouses. Uh, the process of collaborating with another landscape designer that you didn't, or that I didn't know very well, was uh, very interesting. and and very fruitful experience. Um, obviously, when the walker chose to put us together, they were looking that the work was somehow compatible. They weren't trying to you know, put a cat and a, and a mouse in the cage and you know, slam the door and see what happened. Um, and we worked rather well together. Our work, some t both of us, I think, our work sometimes tends to be formal. And we also are very interested in simple simple things, or I hope that this is a, a simple thing. Uh, you can be the judge of that, I guess. Uh, Bobby and I both decided that we wanted to celebrate the, the corridor aspect. I mean, we really could have done anything that we wanted, but we thought that the whole idea of a, the greenhouses, the three of them together, make an a, a interior space that's about 200 feet long. And what we were concerned with was sort of restating that, that passageway rather than making some kind of network of spaces that had an inside and an, and an outside. In other words, what we were trying to avoid was a series of false arrivals as you were approaching the entry to the building, but rather the sense of, of something repeated as a series, a thing that sort of gradually unfolded itself. To do that, um, the parking lots, by the way, are over here um, at this end of the building. To do that, we made a series of topiary arches, which I'll say more about in, in a minute. And then you come into an opening at the center where there's a large palm court that is now lined on the outside with a row of potted um, Panama oranges. And then the other, the south house, which is over here, is a kind of transparent version of the North House. So you have these sort of opaque, stolid, heavy, very fragrant, um, very quiet. The, these big planted structures really absorb a tremendous amount of sound. And so it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's very um, almost sacred experience when you walk through it. This end is very different, very transparent, um, more elements in repetition. Uh, and, um, and, and thinner in their dimension. These have a thickness of about three feet. These are truly scrims, thing that, things that have in their side 
practically no dimension. Um, one of the things that I wanted to explain with the Walker Project through showing you this photograph of Carras is that this was an experience for me of working with a client who had absolutely their aesthetic sense and their expectations were very high. Their experience with landscape architects was zero. They didn't know how to work with landscape architects. They, were, they weren't used to the idea of, of the material. They didn't understand the material. And so one of the things that Barbara and I did was that we showed a lot of examples of analogs, of things. Well, we're not going to do this, but the character of it is going to be sort of like this. And Carantz was an example of that, where we were trying to explain the value of a simple repetitive geometry and the kind of tranquility that can be established with that. This is a detail. Barbara Solomon, by the way, did these, uh, these series of axonometric drawings. That's a closer look at how the four topiary arches work and how the path cuts through the middle. These areas at each side are recessed planting beds with uh, greenhouse trays below grade so that plants can be brought in in pots and sort of um, serve through their flowering period and then be taken to the backup greenhouse and either rejuvenated or, or thrown away. And so it's a landscape that, that doesn't celebrate the sort of cycles of the season the way a lot of my projects try to do. This landscape is sort of you know pumped up all the time. It has to look great. It's the sort of parlor, the foyer, the entry to the museum. Um, the process of figuring out what we're going to do was done with a series of, of elevation and perspective views and a series of plans that we actually sat together and did just to sort of understand the mechanism of how we did that. We met at the architect's office. We figured meeting at either of our offices would be too, too much of a, of a benefit to the other party. So we met on neutral grounds. And it worked out fairly well as a way to work. That's one of the early sketches down there of, of a thing that is repeated in series, just to give you an idea of idea with a clumsy beginning. And this is the built project. Um, the arches themselves are not truly topiary, of course. They're really um, a vine-clad structure that I'll, uh, that I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a minute. And then you can see at the sides, there are these series of places for uh, plants that are rotated uh, between one and three months that are changed by the staff. Um, do I have control of the focus? It's on this. Do you know where it is up here? Malcolm, where's the focus? That's better. Some Munciana joke that the slides are out of focus in the middle. Uh, <laughs> the, um, obviously, uh, we had a number of interesting uh, exchanges with the, with, the, with the art museum about the idea of doing something like this. This is a, really a horticultural invention on our part. Um, we came up with this idea for the design, and we were calling them topiary. And the director of the museum, who's extremely outspoken, very, very amusing, very incredible guy, said, well, that's great, Michael, you know, topiaries, but you know, we have to have an opening in two years. You know, so you know, can you come up with another idea? And it was fortunate that the head of the Minneapolis uh, Park Board and, and Peter Olin from the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum were at the meeting. And they said, you know, we'd like to talk to you about this idea afterwards. And we went out to the greenhouses at the Arboretum and looked at, you know those 
alligators and teddy bears that they make out of wire and they stuff them up with sphagnum moss and grow little vines all over them. Well, that's really where this idea came from. This is kind of a giant, uh, you know, sort of Smurf bear or something. Um, but it turns out that, you know, you can't just take wire and sphagnum and get it to stay in the air, stand up in the air for 16 feet. These structures weigh several tons. They're on massive footings um, that are resting on piles because it's a peat structure. But the whole idea of making a surface that we could plant vines over and get it to cover very quickly really just came from a very simple technology. Then we worked with engineers to work out the structural aspects of it. And we worked with um, a, the largest independently owned nursery in America, Bachman's, which is located in Minneapolis, who conducted a whole series of tests for us, which I've got some pictures of. That's looking down. That's really without the benefit of a wide angle lens, what the experience is like moving through them. And so, you know, you look at those overall views and it looks sort of very self-consciously architectural because of the way the silhouette of the thing repeats the shape of the greenhouse. And that was intentional, but the primary experience is that of moving through a kind of green tunnel. This is uh, just a change of plants to show you the kind of rotations that go on and how it changed the, changes the character of the place. <coughs> this is the, um, that's Jim Kelly um, there, uh, affectionately referred to as Dr. Science. This is Sandy Welsh from the Park Board. This is Jack Snow from the engineer's office. I'm taking the photograph. The consulting dollars were adding up by the hundreds every five minutes. What we did was we grew a whole series of tests of artificial growing medium, applying ficus reefens, growing it on for several months, and seeing how the plants would perform over time on the, on the structure of the green arches. Of course, the, the whole thing was designed before the greenhouses were even built. And so we had this kind of two years, this kind of two winter period, uh, two years of, uh, of winter time to test out experiments with the, with the vine structures. Now, one of the things um, that came to pass was that we needed to have um, a drip irrigation system internally. And it turned out that what we also needed to do was get inside of the thing to service it. And so we actually designed the green arches to be hollow with these little trap doors that you can pull off and get inside. Um, only people with small behinds can be hired um, to do the servicing on this project. It's a kind of weight control plan for <laughs> graduate students at the university. But you can get up inside this thing and service the, um, the drip irrigation system from the inside. And you put the trap door back, and you don't even know that it's been removed. That's, you probably, some of you have seen pictures of this fish or a fish, at least, by Frank Gehry has quite a fascination with them. Um, it's, it in itself is an interesting story. He was, Frank is Jewish. He grew up in Toronto, and his grandmother would bring home fish on Friday night to make certain dishes related with, the, with um, Saturday, the holy day. And so he grew up with, you know, carp swimming around in the bathtub. and. Um, it's a great thing for a little boy to see. And he grew up and became a famous architect and started designing fish for people out of glass. And he did a few of them. You maybe have seen photographs of Rebecca's in Los Angeles, a restaurant with sort of these fish and octopus being suspended. But what I didn't know when Mildred Friedman said to me, it's going to be a fish by Frank Gehry is that she had been curating for four and a half years prior to her rude conversation with me an exhibition on Frank Gehry's work. And they had commissioned this fish to kind of be the grand piece that opens the show. 
And so they were saving it after the show and moving it out to the conservatory. But Bobby and I knew about Frank's fish and his grandmother's in the bathtub and all of that. So we thought it would be interesting to put the fish in a really tiny little pool, sort of like you know the fish had hopped out of the bathtub. And so we suspended the fish above a very small pool. And we had the, the pool lined in black and the water dyed black. So there's a great sense of depth about the thing. So that like you've taken this bathtub and somehow the bottom had gotten very deep and this giant fish had been able to jump out of it. I suppose when people go there, nobody gets the story unless I'm there narrating, but that was our idea behind it anyway. We decided to keep the plantings very spare, very minimal to defer to the fish. And so our original thinking was to have this row of palms around the outside. And then subsequently, Bobby and I got very nervous and had a second row of plants about around the outside. And then when it was being built, the museum director got very nervous and said, it's going to look like a jungle. Don't put in the second row of fish, of, of plants. And then the donors, came, the donors came by at the opening and said, there aren't enough plants in the central house. I think we should have some more plants in the central house. And so we're putting the plants back in the central house this spring. Anyway, design also happens that way, as you will no doubt experience in time. Um, there are a lot of interesting things in moving palms to Minneapolis. Um, it's a whole new, each one of the houses was a whole new technology for me. My office, by the way, did the contract documents and the supervision. Uh, Bobby and I did the design together in schematic design, and then my office did all the implementation. And so we had to do all the research on acclimating the palms, putting them in, having them put in shade houses in, out in Los Angeles and so forth. And that's the fish. The North House is a very interesting uh, thing for landscape architecture and for in the environmental arts that deal with landscape. This, the South House will be redesigned every year or so by a different designer or a different artist. And we were given the first commission as part of the whole package, if you will, to do that first space. And we wanted to make it related to our idea about the, uh, about the processional. And so you can see we made this proposal for a series of thin dividers. Originally, they were going to be sheets of water with panels of um, more aquatic loving plants behind. And then later in the design, they were changed to vine scrimps. I've gotten very fascinated um, with the issue of growing vines over metal structure. And part of it really has to do with a visit long ago to Columbus, Indiana, where Dan Kiley has that, you know, the, the vine structure over the CR, CRS Bell Telephone Station. You know that building? Very shiny glass building. And I've, it struck me as a wonderful kind of play of the sort of organicism of plants, the this, this sort of chaos of vines over something that's very strict and precise. So the, what we ended up doing was making this long series of thin dividers that vines grow up. Right now, it's star jasmine. It'll be uh, greenhouse sweet peas uh, in the late spring and a tropical vine in the summer. And then the same idea between that of a series of sunken panels that the plants um, are rotated in and out of. This is the vines are growing. Uh, that first slide was in September. This is obviously Christmas. Um, and the, the, the design has subsequently been changed. This was a fascinating story. Of um, I decided that I wanted to use amaryllis. I really don't like amaryllis very much. But I got the idea that six or 700 amaryllis blooming at one time would be a really outrageous scene. And uh, you know, sort of coming up, they you know they come out of the ground and they're they're very obscene looking, you know. Um, that's being polite. Um, and I thought it would be really incredible to have kind of all of these amaryllis heads coming out of the 
ground and then right before Christmas, all of, all of them opening up in an incredible red. But we, everything went wrong. First of all, to get that many amaryllis, they had to be shipped from three different sources. They had been treated with different kinds of growth retardants. They had been out of storage longer periods of time, so some of them arrived with buds and some of them were in full dormancy. And the guy doing the ordering also didn't sort of check bulb size, so some were, you know, sort of Chernobyl size. And others were well, sort of miniature, same cultivar. And it, I was out there about two weeks after it was installed, and a director came up to me, and he just said, he said, this looks like a cat box. You know, I'm having it ripped out of here. And it's like they were gone. They were just totally removed, and the amaryllis were put in, which are, I mean, the, the poinsettias were put in. And it was a very interesting lesson for me, not just in sort of this sort of humility of remembering that you can't take anything for granted with plants, but also forgetting that you always have to educate clients about the issue of change when dealing with vegetation, that clients have to be taught to be patient just like you were learning and we have all learned as practicing landscape architects to be patient with plants, and I didn't caution them about that. I mean, it still would have been a disaster because of all the other things that I told you. But I think that if they had arrived all in the same condition, and I hadn't warned them about the issue of, of the slow emergence of the bloom, it still would have been very disliked. This is the vine support system, just to explain the technology of it a little bit. It's, air, it's airline cable. It's um, stainless steel cable braided, wrapped in, um, in plastic, and drawn taut. Um, we had a shipbuilder make this for us, a wonderful shipbuilders in Minneapolis. And the, the bars, they're anchored, obviously, to footings below. And the bars are shot peen stainless steel to really, what we were really trying to do was, um, you know, design word here, but to dematerialize the presence of the structures. We wanted them to be there, but not to be there. And the idea was that with using the very thin wire and by abrading the surface of the stainless steel so it was more neutral and less, you know, less precise in where its edges were, that the overall character of the um, of the structures would be somewhat neutral, which I hope you can see in that. Just to step back for a minute to a project that you may have seen in the Transforming the American Garden exhibit. Subsequent to that show being finished, I have um, done some more work on the project to explore the ideas in a little more detail. And, and basically, one of the points of that exhibition is that, or my entry in that exhibition, is that the transitory qualities of the planted landscape, basically the character of foliage and the presence of flowers and fruits in their fragrance, is very beguiling but very difficult variable. Um, I was sort of raised on the school of planting design. They don't even call it planting design anymore, plants in design or something like that. But you know, planting design, you sort of make a matrix of all the seasons, October through September. You do the planting design. You make sure you have a check in every month, and that's it. You have a good design. I mean, right? That's how planting design was done. That never seemed to work very well for me. And I was trying to figure out a way to make that more a basic part of the design, um, to somehow inform the design with seasonal change. Because one of the things that I had learned through practice in observing the landscape is that when seasonal change happens, whatever, whatever harmony and balance may have been there, it was a complete new harmony and a new kind of balance that changed with each change of the seasons. And, and, and what I was thinking about was, how could you sort of bring that in and make it a primary reason for organizing a landscape? Couple that with the fact that I grew up on a farm and I went to an ag school and my attitude about the landscape really is that it's, a, that it's malleable. 
in, in the good sense of the word, not that, that the wilderness is to be revered, own, uh, is to be revered and, and, and to be replicated, but really that the landscape is something that is meant for, for human beings to, in a responsible, gentle way, manipulate and to change for their own reasons. This is a orchard device uh, in Italy for, you know, orchard trees are usually split. They don't like a, a leader in, in, in apple trees, fruit trees. They want the light to get down in the inside. It makes it easier to pick the fruit to have the branches out, but also in order to get good fruiting in the middle of the plant, you need light to penetrate it. So they take this tree when it's very small and they tie on this, um, this circle. It's made out of uh, obviously grape uh, arbor, uh, grapevine prunings and they start to change the shape of the plant. And that's one of the reasons why orchard trees are always so extraordinarily picturesque um, because they've been, their shape has been so consciously manipulated. So the idea was to make a landscape that used um, plants with very dramatic seasonal changes. And the idea here was to make a, um, a very um, built looking landscape, very precise, very contrived, and to have it um, be something that goes through a series of dramatic changes with the seasons as the plant, plants are in it go through their um, their seasonal changes as well. A little bit about the context. It was conceived as a, as a garden between, the, a garden at the center of a corporation, that instead of designing a building and putting a garden in front of it, you would actually take the, you would take the building and you would split it in half, and sort of tear it apart, pull it to each side, and you would move it all the way through a block of a city. Here's a street out there, there's the sidewalk, there's the other street up there, and there's the sidewalk. And there would be, there would be public passageways under, under loges with overhangs on the side so that people could pass by at night. And then there would be a series of ways of, of containing it at night so that it would be safe, so that, the, so that during the day it could be much more crowded, much more mysterious, much more potentially dangerous at night than we would normally um, think of or be allowed to make um, an urban landscape with. The other thing that the building was trying to do was celebrate passages in the landscape, corridors. And the landscape has a series of hedged walkways that were intended to be crossing points for people, you know, running to the soda machine or going to a meeting, and that you wouldn't even put your coat on. It would be a temperate place, and you would dash back. It's 100 feet wide. You would dash back and forth across, um, across that space. And the issue of how that would change with the seasons, there's a, water there's a water wall and an ice wall down in the back, which I'll show you in a minute celebrating the, 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 the sort of transparency of deciduous plants, carefully layered against evergreen plants. So there would still be a lot of spatial definition, um, but trying to make something of that. The other thing I was very interested in here was the kind of the asymmetry, but the balance of early modernist compositions. I, I always like the light structures of um, Maholi Naj, you know, those light modulating devices. And um, I thought it would be interesting to try to make a landscape that would look like the, um, the Schroeder house is in architecture, you know, the important a milestone in early modernism. There were a couple of other things that have carried forward into my current projects that I'm working on. One of them is the idea of isolating plants that have very dramatic seasonal changes. This is a room um, in a book that I just co-authored with Judith Tankard on the 
about the, the photographs of Gertrude Jekyll, I talk about, not about Eudoxia, which is the name of this project, but I talk about um, the Iris Garden at Parc Bagatelle, which is by um, Forestier, a very interesting um, park designer and landscape architect at the turn of the century. And he designed a part of the Bagatelle where the only, it's a hedged room with a large bed of iris in the middle. And it just struck me as the most incredible thing to have done, to have sort of set, a, set aside a room in a landscape where the various things that happen to one species of plant could be celebrated. It's a mixture of iris in, in Bagatelle, Siberian iris and German iris, uh, German iris and, um, and Japanese iris. iris. They're mixed together, but basically it only blooms for about a two-month period. And the rest of the year is about the rise and the fall of that foliage. Now, you would obviously only do this as a small part of a larger landscape. If you had a small landscape, you wouldn't turn it over to one plant. You know, you wouldn't design the entry to this building and say, well, why do I care if they look at dead iris leaves all winter? You know, that's kind of not the point of this. This is more about solitude and um, using the landscape as a place of sort of contemplation and the way that plants can provide that. And one of the things that's very difficult about working in a large office setting is that the variety of of, of experiences and emotions that we have as human beings are very poorly provided for in the workplace. You know, if you are at work and you find something tragic has happened to, I mean, we spend much of our lives, most of our waking hours at work, and the work environment really needs to be a place to provide for the whole range of human experience. And I think that if that was the way we thought about making the work environment more that, that, that just the way we felt about working and simple capitalist things like productivity and wanting to be at work would be different. Anyway, that's the water garden down below. The iris garden is here. You walk through the hedge into the iris garden, this long bed of iris at the middle, and then over to an overlook. And then the wall that this gent is um, standing over is the ice water wall, and those are trays, tray, what I call water trays, which is, are not really standing water, but thin, um, thin sheets of water that are, that are sprayed along the bottom of recessed pools. And it was the idea of not wanting rails around the edge of this thing. And so the idea was that you could walk on these thin paths and that the water was down there, but it was very thin and very active. And it was an idea that I got from a piece of sculpture by, um, by a sculptor <laughs> whose work is outside the uh, IBM building in New York. I don't know if you've seen that piece of stone with the water shooting over it. Really great way to use water and not have to worry about safety and so forth. Um, celebration of a single moment, very different application of the idea. Um, but while, we were, were, while Bobby Solomon and I were working on the conservatory, the Dayton Hudson department store came to us and said, we want you to design a two-week temporary landscape that will be on the 10th floor of our corporate headquarters in downtown Minneapolis. And we thought, oh my God, you know, this is, this is the end, you know, this is, this is going to be the most vulgar thing that we've ever done in our lives. It turned out to be incredible. Maybe it's vulgar, but it was incredible. They really said you can do anything you want within reason, and the budget was not endless. I mean, the aesthetics of it were up to us. And so what we decided to do was to take one of the ideas from the walker, which was that of taking one species of plant and sort of having it really um, engage the place for a short period of time, not really like the iris, because the iris are really meant to be there as a 12-month cycle, but more like the walker idea of a single snippet and having it take over the place. So, that they, so what they did was they forced 
60,000 tulips into bloom. And we made a, a walkway around the outside with steps. And there are lots of chairs in here. You can't see them very well. And the walker loaned a sculpture um, to use for it. It was a tribute to the opening of the sculpture garden. So there was this um, Heron Bell by Barry Flanagan and two Moors, actually. It was a rem remarkable collection and a small water element with iris. Very simple promenade. Basically a place to come in for people to come off the street or shoppers to come in and bring their lunch and sit on the edge of the tulip field. You can see the chairs here. They're movable chairs. I think it's every landscape architect's dream to not spend another thousand dollars on a timber form bench and to just buy some really inexpensive cafe chairs and put them out in the park and let people pull them in the sun or put them in the shade. But of course, people put them in the back of their pickups and take them home. So you spend $1,000 on the bench, and you spend the $300 for the concrete footing that it's attached to. Anyway, this was inside, and it was miraculous. They found these crummy little chairs for $5 a piece from Taiwan. And they probably would last about six weeks, but they only needed them for two weeks, and they spray painted them, and it was terrific. One project in a region sometimes begets another. <laughs> and this is another Minnesota project, very different, really, from the things that I've been talking about. It was a collaboration with Harrison Fraker, who's the head of the School of Architecture there, a very experimental house, a retirement house um, for a couple who had lived in kind of, as Bob was saying earlier, a little bit of Cape Cod their whole life. Right next door, you've got to understand the whole story. These people reached their 60th birthday and they said, hey, you know, time's running out. We're going to be old someday. We want to live in a really really interesting house. But they were also thinking about their old age. And so the house had to be on one level. So the house is, this is their children's, their, who are my age, the sort of children's bedrooms are upstairs. The house is on one floor. And then there had to be a basement area so that if they ever needed to have a nurse, if they were at the very end of their lives, that somebody could actually have a room of their own below. Um, the house is, is conceived as a series of different gestures to the landscape. It's a very interesting house. This is a, obviously a screen porch here, looking out to Lake Wyzetta, which is behind me. But the house makes a series of kind of pavilion, attached pavilions that, are, that make adjustments for very special views in the house so that the, it looks very decon, it looks very sort of of the moment, but in fact, and it is partly intended to be that way, but it also is very much a house about the landscape that tries to set up a series of views. This is in the living room, looking out to the pavilion of the house that they used to own next door. It's a really incredible thing to think about being in your early 60s and moving next door and looking at the landscape that you, through your entire married life, lived in. Now, they're very remarkable people. Anyway, um, a lot of fun things with the landscape. They're both really avid gardeners. And we were able to make this garden. Um, we found an abandoned quarry, and we had access to all of this granite that was relatively inexpensive. And we made this grid of raised French beds. And the idea of that, I'll go back a little bit, because I should have showed you this in the first slide. This picture doesn't show it very well, but basically what I tried to do with the landscape was to make the landscape a datum that this house, you know, kind of cranks and rotates and is, is um, contained within. And so we made this very long hedgerow of spruce trees and then this grid of raised beds for gardening and then this strong, these are very wimpy and young here, but a strong row of um, cardinal red stem dogwood, which will eventually be, will eventually bulge right out to the edge of this, of this thing like this all the way down. It's very graphic. 
this house is moving all around and jumping all over the place. And then at the property line, there's a very straight line that's struck by that edge. And obviously one of the things that we were thinking about, or I was thinking about with the raised bed, was the way it celebrates you know, snow falling over it. And these haven't been planted yet. They were filled with soil and it snowed, but the, um, the gardens haven't been in yet. And in future years, there'll be stubble of plants you know, and clipped off perennials and cutting flowers and so forth. So there'll be kind of, I hope, this whole mosaic of things to look down on uh, in the winter. Anyway, the, the lower area was sort of, the whole project was kind of a topographic nightmare. There's a tremendous amount of grade change. And at the back of the property, there was this long slotted space. And Kim Whitney keeps his vegetables. He has two kinds of vegetables, pretty vegetables and ugly vegetables. And the pretty vegetables are going to be in the raised beds by the house. And that'll be you know, lettuce and maybe tomatoes. But things like corn and um, pole beans and stuff like that, he's going to have in another vegetable plot that's down the hill. And I talked the Whitney's into kind of making this abrupt grade change in this very narrow site at the, at the precipice at the end of the driveway, a kind of whole mystery landscape that has to do with the starkness of, of winter in Minnesota and the sort of whole, almost a kind of um, Viking presence, this sort of north, very heavy feeling. And so these. Um, gates were designed out of stone. And then this flight of, of stairs, all, all made with um, quarry salvage stone coming down. And the landscape was kept in kind of a dwarf state. Um, immense, immense lilacs were collected. You can see them here. And instead of putting in trees that are going to get big, we found these old lilacs that are mature. So there will always be this sense of domination of those um, those gates over the grove that you walk through and it's a, it's the whole idea is framing this view down to the gardens at the other end of the site where I, where I'm standing there just a couple uh, just got two more projects to show you and then I'm finished I've done a lot of experimentation with ice, and I wanted to step back and show you a proposal for a square I did in St. Paul in a competition. <laughs> the major focus of the square is this undulating wall of water and ice, which was inspired by a lot of things. It was, I was a vegetarian when I was in graduate school, and it was partly inspired by going to a Japanese market called the Ginza Market in Urbana, where I was not familiar with river fish and you know lake fish. And they would bring in these big fish, very ugly, very gelatinous to me. And they would sort of put them down, and they were for sale. I thought they should be for compost. Um, and so I, I, I was several years later, I was designing this. And I was thinking about water. And this site is near the Mississippi. And I was thinking about the fact that have you ever read Jonathan Rabin's book, Old Glory? He talks about not being able to find the beginning of the Mississippi River in St. Paul. He's, it's a story about an Englishman who gets in a rowboat and goes down. You know, it's Huck Finn. He goes down the Mississippi River in a rowboat. And so I thought that doing some kind of um, narrative in the fountain about the, the, the waters that fed the Mississippi would be an interesting thing to do. And so the water was, the wall was made as a series of undulations, trying to be, as, it, um, emote some of the rhythmic quality of moving water. And the banding was done with different, was, I keep saying was done. Of course, I didn't win the competition and it wasn't built. They didn't build the winning entry either. I suppose that would have been um, more disheartening. Um, but the idea was, you know when you see riverways, the sort of cutaway sedimentary quality of the layers of, of different kinds of soil? The idea was to suggest some of that, um, not too blatantly in a kind of abstracted way. And then the gargoyles would be river fish. 
And in the winter, in the summer, the water would, they would also be carved on the side of the stone as half reliefs. In the summer, they would be covered up. And then in the winter, you would drain the water away. Obviously, to get ice formations to build up, you'd have to uh, have a heated bottom to the pool so that the ice would melt in the bottom and, and not spill onto pedestrian ways. But I thought it would be neat to see the fish kind of revealed, you know, half frozen uh, in the ice. I, you know, as a kid, I always imagined that fish were frozen in the water in winter, you know, that they just kind of became these chunks. You know, you could cut a chunk of ice out and put it up and thaw it out, and there'd be a fish in it. Um, the fish were intended to be um, slightly this. Gargoyles were going to be a little bit bigger than uh, the human head and um, in a slightly superior position, just a little bit above six feet so that they would be sort of spewing this water down on you as you went by. Or in the winter, there would be these kind of, and this is pre-Frank Gary, okay? I didn't even know about Frank's fish when I did this. But in the winter, there would be like this burst of ice coming out of the mouths of the fish. Anyway, um, it didn't win. Um, at the time and subsequent to that, I had been very interested in ice as a design art material. And right after doing that competition, I got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to study the technical aspects of dealing with ice in an urban environment. And so I set up this laboratory. Now, you have to remember that I was trained in research by you know, Sue Weideman, one of the goddesses of research in America. Le really learned how to do research right. I mean, Sue would die if she saw this. It was just like you know, a maniac was at work here. Basically, we just set up this place where we experimented with water. It was real primary research. I didn't have any particular expectation at the end of the tunnel. I went there to learn about what the technical problems were when you were dealing with ice. And it, it really was an incredibly exciting experience for me visually. I learned a lot about the technical problems, but I much more got excited about the idea of working with ice as a material. And I mention this because I think that too often as landscape architects, we, we don't take on the challenge of, of figuring out new technologies for doing, you know, you sort of get a crazy idea and, you know, some stick in the mud says, oh, you can't do that, that won't work, it'll fall down. You say, okay, I won't do that. And it can be a lot of fun to try to figure out how to do that idea. You may have to wait for the right client opportunity. I experimented with ice for four years in my back garden, my own house, before anybody would even look at it. My neighbors, of course, sort of crossed the street um, when they saw me coming, um, but it was, a great, it was a great way to get started. Then in, 19, in last winter, 1988, I was hired by the um, arts office at Harvard to do an, an installation to celebrate the opening of a, of a new dormitory on the campus. And what I made was a series of ice walls that were like a maze. Um, and this is obviously partly related to the idea of Eudoxia, where there would be these sort of curved corridors that you could sort of, you could see ahead of you, but you couldn't see really beyond the corner, so there was some safety, but some mystery when you were within the place. And instead of doing it with hedges, I did it with wire. And then if you put wire and vines together, you understand um, the, uh, the Davis Vine Maze project, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Anyway, there, was the, there were these walls that you could sort of walk through. And at, at the, the night of the opening, we had these flares out there. And it was, it was fun. It was up for about a month. It had to be re-iced um, uh, about eight times, like six or eight times in the month of February last year. 
And it was one of the things that's really remarkable about ICE is how, I mean, of course, it's a completely it's a, it's a complete emitter of light. You know, it just grabs light and throws it back to you. And depending on the cloud cover or the quality of sunlight that day, the, the whole um, the whole landscape changes very much because of the, the of the uh, ice itself. It's very much like like glass block that way. Um, again, it was all you know based on the NEA research, finding out about dealing with freezing and structure and the irrigation system, which we adapted. Then we had to figure out how to bend the pipe and deal with that whole um, technology as well. <coughs> um, just, I think we're running out of time. I, I'm going to bounce over this project so I can show you the, uh, the Vine Scrim project. The last project I want to show you was my entry in the Davis Garden Competition um, last spring. And um, I had not visited the site. I find it very difficult to work on competitions where you haven't, you don't, or, or on any project really where you haven't been to the site. I mean, you just don't know. It's almost a joke to do something when you don't know anything about the particular place. So I, I didn't enter the master plan because I didn't think I knew enough about the site, but I I wanted to design a garden as a kind of fragment. I don't so much mean a garden that is eroded or deteriorated, but I mean a garden that was somehow out there in the landscape that you would discover. And the Arboretum at Davis has a lot of meadow areas. Uh, this is not a photograph of it. This is just a nice meadow photograph that I had in my um, bag of tricks. But this, the the setting is very much like this meadow in Maine or wherever it is, which is that there's tall grasses and it's, it's floriferous and green some of the year and very dry at other parts of the year. The other thing that I knew was I really wanted to, I wanted to define, or as architects would say, I wanted to figure a space with trees. I wanted to have this thing really a room made out of plants. And so um, I was working for about three months with um, whale shapes, flattened curves straight on one side, trying to define something with those shapes um, within a field, within a large area that was defined. And I couldn't get them to work. And um, I struck upon the idea of a kind of of a maze that would work in, a, in an urbanized area, that you would somehow have a maze that was broken apart so that from any one point in it, you would feel relatively secure, but you would also have a sense of mystery and, and of being surrounded by the landscape. And so I struck upon the idea of a vine collection um, and the idea of taking um, a square and defining the uh, I think you have to advance that one by hand. Got stuck earlier. Just give the carousel a little. Up, oh, wrong way. There you go. So the idea was that you would take this square and you would define the edges of it. Now remember, you're sort of coming through a meadow. And it's not an orthogonal landscape. It's very irregular. There's a lot of topography. And you actually look down on this site where I proposed the garden from a hill. So you'd sort of look down in there. And you'd see this little space defined with cypress trees. And then um, striped between it would be flowering trees so that the character of the envelope would change at some particular moment in the season. And then at the middle, there would be this series of 15 foot by 15 foot panels of semi drought tolerant vines, which are many of them very long blooming. So that in the middle, there would be kind of this place, you know, you could, what I worked on the, uh, on the master plan for the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, 
I was very horrified at how much children hated the Arboretum. It was sort of like I saw all these kids with these sort of, you know, long faces. Mom and Dad was dragging them around the Arboretum. And I wanted to make a place in the Arboretum where kids could sort of roughhouse and run around and whoever brought them there could sort of learn about one particular group of plants. And uh, that's what I was trying to do with, uh, with this project. Um, I want to leave, that's just about my hour, and I wanted to leave time for questions. So I think I'll just cut it off and take questions from the audience and lights. Yes. Very beautiful garden with uh, with the drawings of the season. Where where is that garden? That was an entry um, in a in a comp in a in a fictional uh, project that I helped to organize called Transforming the American Garden. It doesn't exist. Is it published? It's the drawings are published in. Um, In a uh, Japanese magazine, uh, not process, um, I can't remember the name of it, not global architecture. They're going to, they, they will eventually be published in, in an American journal, I hope. Now, the quiz for the freshmen is going to be based on the question and answer period, so you better stay around. <laughs> grading? You mean from the condens the drop dripping of the condensation? Everything is, is per, just per drainage. Um, just all the pavement is set in sand. You notice there's a pretty serious crown on the walk so that anything that falls on the, on the walkway sort of pitches to the side. And all the drainage in the beds is just to gravel. It's not, it's not under drain. We were talked out of that by we did a, obviously a lot. I was very lucky that one of my employees, very lucky is modest. I was incredibly lucky that one of my employees has a PhD in greenhouse management. He's, at, he's in the master's program at Harvard and I'm desperately trying to hire him to stay in. There are a number of uh, images of very small gardens for uh, urban houses, small urban gardens. I don't know. I I hope it makes it better, bigger. Do you want it to get bigger and better? Or you better. I want it. To, I don't want it to get too much bigger. Um, when I when I was about thirty, which was about eight years ago, um, I tried. I decided. God, you know, I this profession. You know, what am I doing? You know, I, I mean, I lost my eyesight, which you all will if you draft. I had great, the doctor used to remark about my eyesight, but you know, seriously, I was very bummed out. And I, I decided to do some research on the careers of a number of landscape architects and what they did. And Kevin Lynch actually is the one who counseled me to do this, a great man. He died a few years ago. But he said, you know, I'm not a landscape architect, but you know, you and you're in a very difficult field, and it's very shat upon by the other design professions. And we all need, you know, landscape architecture and better landscape architects. Go out and figure out how to be one. He wasn't firing me. Um, 
So I, I, I looked at Garrett Ekbo and I tried to figure out how Garrett Ekbo got started and what he did. And I saw that he taught. And I knew that he made up projects and published them. I'm very honest about it. You know, so that was partly where the, one of the ideas for transforming the American garden came from that. But Kevin really said to me, you know, one of the problems of your field, and I was talking about this earlier tonight, is that it takes so long to learn about your mistakes. He said, you really should do private gardens. It'll never, building anything, you know, it may have negative connotations um, to a certain degree in the beginning of your career if you do a lot of gardens. But he said, you'll learn so much about making landscapes. And I still do, we do a lot of gardens. I just chose not to talk about it. But gardens were really um, an important part of learning about the landscape, not for garden's sake, but for landscape's sake. Um, we have a couple of, we have, set, I mean, we have four or five gardens in the office, not modest. A lot of the first gardens I did were very modest, you know, construction budget of four or five thousand. I have to make a living now. That was, I'm married to an independent filmmaker, so about every four years, you know, she gets paid. <laughs> So I get paid every four months instead. Any other questions? You sure? Okay, well thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here.